Okay, well, we're going to close the course with this sort of bookend to our intro. We began the course talking about the approach of the holy, and um, we were, uh, so to speak, just entering the chamber of the great al Mutasim, or we were hovering in our spaceship over the great mystery planet Solaris. <clears throat> Here we'll talk about two modern encounters with uh, what Rudolf Otto called the holy. I think Bernadette Roberts would be okay with that term, as would Dr. Rick Strassman for uh, some of his uh, test subjects characterization of the DMT experience. But um, when we first talked about the holy, I think I mentioned that the holy was at the historical core of so many religions that the founders of religions are uh, not just great speakers or politicians. They are uh, mystics. They're people who've left the village and gone to the desert or up the mountain, at least figuratively, and made contact with something. Now, what that thing is, uh, they will characterize as God <clears throat> or as um, the ultimate reality. Maybe it's uh, just the depths of their own soul. Though if Notice if your own soul, uh, when you make contact with it, you're just your own depth psychology, um, just the silent you that's there behind all of the uh, masks and habits that you put on. If that thing, when made contact with, gives you the most powerful experience of your life, which seems to outstrip all of the other powerful experiences and which motivates you to run back into the village screaming holy truth and gives you the social energy and charisma and magnetism to found what we end up calling a religion or a cult. Well, you, you are pretty extraordinary too, so we should wonder exactly what we mean by the only or the just in the claim that you only make contact with yourself, right? The idea is that you didn't meet God. There's no such thing as God. You just made contact with something in yourself which had been unaccessed till then. Well, okay, fine. Well, then who are you? What is what is the self if it feels like God? Anyway, I didn't want to give the impression that this is something that we once had contact with whatever it is, and uh, now we just read accounts of the contact with the holy is alive and well. And um, we can talk about Bernadette Roberts, and then we can talk about a much more um, democratized, distributed form of enlightenment, a sort of chemical, chemically induced enlightenment. But uh, Bernadette Roberts, you've got an uh, interview with her. Uh, she's chronicled her life in a series of sort of autobiographical, this like sp this tradition of what's called spiritual autobiography. It's, it's, it's a particular seeker narrating their own life story, but very much focused on their spiritual journey, on how they um, were drawn to a kind of spiritual path and then what they discovered on that path. And Bernadette Roberts is really... Uh, you know, in detail, chronicled her journey as a, well, we can start by calling her a Catholic contemplative. Um, Catholicism is her home church, though she feels taken a little outside of some of its presumptions, or she um, has experiences along her particular path which seemed to take her off the 
path of milestones from her own Catholic Church. She she was on a path where she wasn't seeing um, much record in her own tradition of uh, similar experiences by past prophets and mystics. She'll eventually find a parallel to her experience in Buddhism. It's this experience of something more like a void when we when we have characterized God through our, you know, perfect being theology, through this exercise of trying to define God, the attributes have usually been positive ascriptions, meaning things that God is, and usually these are, uh, <clears throat> I mean, these are attributes, infinitized, these are attributes we're familiar with from our own experience, like power, we have power, we have energy. We have competence, we have ability, we have effects on things around us. God just has that to the power of infinity. Um, <clears throat> or God has that without the correlative um, um, I'm trying to think of the right word here, but let me just give the example. We are a cause we have the power to cause things around us to move but we seem to be it's almost like there's a cost to that which is that we then have to be subject to the effects of of the system we're immersed in so you get to push things but things get to push you then too god is the thing that only pushes he's he's the the unmoved mover god is all these positive attributes infinitized and so it seems very much the opposite of a void or a nothing. God is a capital S something, right? And it's interesting that a lot of mystics who seek direct experience of God rather than just correct inferences about God or having the correct set of doctrines about God... <sighs> Or instead of worrying about just saying the right things to God in prayer, they want to hear back from God, right? The mystic is someone who seeks direct contact with the ultimate reality. And if you're a Catholic, that would be God, the highest of the high. It's interesting how many of these mystics report something like a void. I mean, this is very much what Otto was reporting when he sums his research into global mysticism, historical mysticism, into his formula, Mysterium Tremendum at Fascinans. The Mysterium is really the key word. That's the key subject term there. And a mystery is a void. I mean, a mystery is a kind of, you know, what, what's called an epistemological void. A mystery is a nothing relative to your knowledge of it. You don't know anything about it but you know it's there you know it's there though i guess i mean god is clearly <laughs> if, if you want to uh, praise god by praising god's mystery it's interesting then atheism the fact that people are tempted by atheism and that atheism is this perennial option that is uh, in this world it's easy to be an atheist meaning um god is so far from us that it's easy to start thinking god's not there well Maybe that's just a testament to God's reality. God is such a mystery <laughs> that you wonder if God is even there. So Roberts, Bernadette Roberts, if you had to place her with a couple words, you could say she's a mystic who uh, has emphasized in, in, or has had encounters with and then emphasized in her reports back to the village, back to us, the void-like nature of this ultimate reality. And she finds, when she's looking for parallels, doing research, I mean, she's a she's a learned person. Uh, she went to school and I think went to graduate school and was a teacher for a time. And she knows how to use a library, um, like many mystics in her tradition did. A lot of them were the first, very first scholars, parts of the very first universities in Europe, like Paris and Oxford and Cambridge, a lot of the, you know, the, the medieval university very much emerges out of the monastic model, from what I can tell.
And uh, she's researching her own tradition first, I think, to find if anyone in her tradition has re reported this experience of a void. And she, she, I don't think she finds clear parallels, it's, but she comes across a phrase in Buddhism, uh, a, a purported quote from the Buddha himself, where he says, the, um, you know, the roof is broken now. And she takes that to mean um, the one, the grounding of of reality, which is, which you think for a time maybe is the ultimate reality, is just the um, doorway into this void. I mean, the chamber of Al Mutasim may just be an empty chamber, <laughs> and. Uh, the person of Al Mutasim, the reputation of the person, is just the thing that gets you to the door, and then the thing itself is just empty. And uh, this is her experience of the ultimate reality. She begins with these a, a period where she's immersed in a kind of unitive experience of the divine reality, and then a, there's a kind of terrifying, very upsetting period of her life where that falls away, and there's nothing there. It's like the ground is pulled off, from, or the roof is pulled off her head. And um, Notice in her own way, she's making a very bold claim. I mean, it's a kind of like a rap song, you know? Like, I mean, in rap, it's very obvious that the rapper is boasting and basically asserting their excellence and their superiority to certainly their fellow rappers. It seems to me like about half of rap is boasting. She's doing a kind of rap. Uh, I mean, I don't know if her intention is to boast. She might just be telling the truth. But in effect, she's saying, I, I'm i not just someone who's ex had mystical experience, who has found a way in the modern world to um, make contact with the ultimate reality. But the experience I had went far beyond anything I was able to find documents of in my own tradition. And she even says in Buddhism, I mean, she had researched Buddhism and she couldn't find parallels to her own experience in it until she found that one quote, or supposed quote by Buddha himself. So she's saying, maybe, maybe the founder of Buddhism, which is sort of, it seems to be the supreme monastic or contemplative religion. I mean, Buddhism, more than any of the major faith traditions, has really emphasized, I'm not saying it's the greatest religion in the world, I'm saying it's emphasized the path of mystical pursuit. I mean, that's its founder was someone who just left the world and single-mindedly pursued enlightenment on his own, basically. I mean, and for the final push, he was just sitting under a tree um, and fasting and with perfect concentration, cutting through the noise and illusion to get to the ultimate reality. And, and Buddhism takes that to be its model. It's very much a monastic religion who's, I mean, the, the true Buddhist is a monk, is someone who's follow, uh, following its founder. And uh, she's saying, maybe in this religion, the supreme mystical monastic religion, in reports of its founder, was there a parallel to my own experience? <laughs> so she's saying, is she saying she's the greatest mystic in the, in the, in the, reported history of human mysticism? I don't know. And anyway, that doesn't mean it's not true. Maybe she's saying it and it's true. Uh, but um, maybe these experiences are a little bit like falling in love. It's just in the nature of falling in love that there's the part of you that's falling in love, not not the reflective, rational part of you who might might be riding along with the, the soul who's fallen in love, but the one who's in love can't help but think that, as the Leonard Cohen song goes, no no one's loved like this before. It's a paraphrase of Leonard Cohen. Actually, that's a butchering of Leonard Cohen. I think Leonard Cohen said the opposite. I think it's, he says, I know that others have loved before. <laughs> right, Leonard Cohen is the, uh, 
that's the uh, that's the rational part of Leonard Cohen's mind in that song lyric where he says, I, I know that others have loved like us before, but the but that's at least implied there in that song is it really feels like no one's ever loved like us before. It's kind of in the nature of falling in love. It feels singular. It feels at least like this is meant to be. The reality might be that there are 6,423 people in Canada with whom you could have had just as intense a connection, but the contingencies of your life put you with this person. And once you're with that person, it feels singular. It feels like this was meant to be, this had to be, and there could have been no one else. It's a little bit like when a movie is well cast, uh, you feel uh, it had to be Joaquin Phoenix playing that role. Who, who else could have done it? Well, that just means Joaquin did a great job. There might actually be six other actors who could have done an interesting job with that role, but Joaquin killed it. And so it feels like when you watch it that he was destined to play that role and no one else could have played it. And maybe these mystical experiences are like that too, but maybe more so. You're making contact with some kind of ultimate reality. And it's just in the nature of that contact that you feel there's nothing else like this experience I had. Certainly nothing else like this in my own life, but maybe it's hard to avoid projecting that thought larger and, and thinking um, no one else surely has had this experience. In a funny way, that kind of so. So what what I'm saying here is, I'm, I'm, I'm you know I'm putting Bernadette Roberts on the psychotherapist couch a little bit and shrinking her head, shrinking the sort of ego trip she might be on. Which is kind of funny for someone who's killed the ego, apparently in her mystical pursuits. But I'm saying. Maybe it's a sign of authentic mystical contact that you come back from it claiming to be the Messiah or claiming to be uh, the highest of the high or claiming to be God and then getting crucified for it. Right? I mean, I mean, on the one hand, you might think that cult leaders are just narcissists who figured out a way to, you know, done a little bit of meme engineering and figured out how to take advantage of humanity's religious propensities and to get themselves elevated to a position of alpha malehood for a time and there's certainly a lot of that kind of predatory cultism but in in a most interesting cults i'm familiar with uh it, it's it's more than that it's the the founder of it is not just a fraud it's not just someone who knows how to act like someone who's seen god the founder is someone who knows how to translate some actual experiences that they've had of something they've they've usually made contact with something and i think some of them sincerely come back from that contact feeling that they are god it's very common in these mystical experiences to i mean i think of this guy adi da you want to see an example of you know i think an ego out of control from a modern mystic you can look up adi da that was one name he went by. He was a, he was a New York born, uh, like a baby boomer, a little bit pre baby boomer. And by the 1970s, he had a pretty active community around him um, in California. And then I think they eventually moved to one of, one of the, was it one of the Hawaiian islands? Or was it Fiji? Boy, I forget. I think Hawaii initially. Anyway, he was a, you know, he was a seventies cult leader if you want to, but, and, uh, and you, you might think, was this guy just a clever uh, charlatan who knew how to manipulate people and uh, to profit off of that manipulation? Well, yeah, surely he was partly that. Um, but I think he was also someone who made contact with something. And in, in some of his writing, which like, so like Bernadette Roberts, he's someone who's chronicled his, his mystical journey in, in spiritual autobiographies. Some of these autobiographies are written entirely in capitals. Um, he's yelling at you. And uh, he, he claimed that this is the only way to adequately represent the intensity of the experience. So yeah, caps are an intense way of speaking and it certainly hurts the eyes for the reader. And uh, he, I mean, he's made various claims about who he is, what he is, but it, 
it reminds me a little bit of Bernadette Roberts. Uh, they seem like such very different people. <laughs> but uh, um, they're similar in that they come back from the, this experience claiming in their own way. I mean, Adi in a very obvious way. It was kind of a megaphone pinned to his mouth. Claims that, I mean, he says things like, all previous mystics and prophets have made it at most to this sixth level and that he's the only one to have broken through to the seventh level and he gives names to these different categories. It's ludicrous. But I think it's at least indication, in my reading of his personality, it's an indication that he had some very intense experience. And maybe the ego gets a hold of The ego isn't actually gone and the ego gets a hold of it and knows how to milk that experience. It's a real experience for self magnification and and roberts warns of that she warns that as you're really approaching the final thing which is actually a nothing for her the uh there's a great fireworks show that goes off and this is this is there in the reports of siddhartha gotama's own final push to enlightenment he becomes the buddha the enlightened one under the Bodhi tree. And in the final, I don't know, minutes, hours, days, <clears throat> who knows what it was in real time of his push to enlightenment some 2,600 years ago. Mara, the great tempter, appears with his daughters, the daughters of Mara, the great temptresses of the world. Uh, Mara he, uh, um, sends a hail of arrows at the meditating seeker who's making, he's just on the brink of conquering the world to conquer the world in buddhism is to conquer mara conquer maya conquer illusion and he's just on the edge of it and illusion mara maya gives this final fireworks display to pull him back into the the world of samsara illusion maya and uh you know you can if you're doing the movie version of buddha's life you can represent this in various various ways you can have the daughters of mara parade before him scantily clad and ooing and awing and tempting him with the flesh, quite literally. Um, Bernadette Roberts reports being tempted by various masks that the self, the self itself. So for her, I mean, she speaks a little less metaphorically than some of the older traditions. She uses some of the language of modern, you know, modern depth psychology. Just the, the self is the thing that's tempting you. It's not Mara, it's not capital M Maya, it's not the devil in the desert tempting Jesus in his 40 days. It's just the old self, that the most familiar thing, the thing you've been so far, and you're about to leave it behind and, and truly enter the void. And the self is desperate, maybe. It's, it's, it's using its last ploys and tactics to get you to stay with it to stay with a self and the self is just masks the self is just a series of masks and when they fall away the reality is there which is nothing the face your real your quote-unquote real face is just a mask and when it falls away there's nothing and uh, the self according to roberts tempted her i mean it presented her with masks which were really tempting to her it doesn't sound like she was someone who would be tempted by the daughters of mara or the um, studs of Mara. It sounds like someone who she she was someone who was tempted by the thought of being a, a great healer or a great teacher, right? So the the quote unquote temptation she faced at the end was to oh Bernadette take what you've learned now and go back into the world and heal the world and teach the world. You, Bernadette, or we'll give you a new name. We'll call you Saint Bernadette, and you will go back into the world, and you will, you will teach the world, and you will heal the world. She's tempted by this role of savior. It's a noble role, and you might start to wonder, is this really even a temptation, or is this the ego now working in conjunction with the ultimate reality to actually heal the world. You know, I mean, but she gives up the self. Maybe she made a mistake. Maybe it's, 
Maybe when, when you give up the self, angels cry, God slaps his forehead. There's a palm slap, what's that called, a face palm. God's like, why do you think I made a world full of selves and duality? You're disrespecting my creation when you give it all up. I made it for a reason. Don't don't diss the self. Just make sure you've got the right kind of self. And Bernadette Roberts has offered a self which would be a savior, which would go into the world and help it and heal it. And you might say, well, what's so bad about ego if it can get you then to um, help help others? But she thinks of it as a temptation, and uh, she pushes on into the void. And the void sounds kind of like a terrible place. It's it's uh, it's maybe awful that that's the ultimate reality. And maybe when you meet the void, you really are understanding the mystery at the core of existence. The mystery at the core of existence is a great nothing. It's like the it's like the the Wizard of Oz, who behind all the green screening and smoke and mirrors is just a little little professor. And maybe in encountering the void, you you understand. Uh, oh, that's why there's a world. You realize why God would make a world. That's, I mean, that's, when we get, when we talked about the problem of evil, we were talking about why there's imperfection in the world. But if you really pursue that question, it takes you to the question of why there's a world at all. By world, we mean a, a universe with differences with me and you and space and time. And why is anything happening? It's a real problem for theism. If you believe God is perfect already, you, you ask, well, why would God make a world then? If God is perfect as God is, why does God create this world? Um, and it might be that God isn't perfect, or God's perfection is kind of static <clears throat> and, and lonely, and God creates a world so that things can happen which can't happen if there's only God. If there's only God, all you have is knowledge. You don't have any learning, right? Remember the greater goods defense? Learning is a greater good. Heroism is a greater good. And you can't have these greater goods without a world. You can't have these goods without, you can't have learning without ignorance first. And you get to the void and you, you maybe understand why, why a world happens. You say, ah, I've, I've reached the ultimate reality. I've reached the original reality. And you say, ah, I can see why if you were hanging out here for eternity. You might, out of something like boredom or despair, create a world, even a world with imperfection and suffering. It might be that that is preferable to nothing. Nothing is terrible. We think of mystical experience being this I mean, the unitive mystical experience right, that Andrew Newberg is researching in Pennsylvania. This is usually thought to be the kind of gold standard of mystical experience. Even, even Christian mystics who believe that God is separate from them um, will have experiences where they share, they use language like sharing in God's glory. It's like they've become one with God's reality. And they just when they report back to the Christian tribe what happened, they don't say, I became God or I became one with God. They'll say, I shared in God's glory. I was in God's presence and there was great intimacy there. The uh, mystics from the South Asian tradition are a lot more comfortable talking about unity with the divine reality and becoming the divine reality. The, the, great, the great mantra, I think, of Hinduism or of, let's call it Vedic religion is Tat. Asi Tatvam Asi A S I Mouse writing, sorry. Um Thou art oh god, I still gotta write that on Thou art that. If I could just type it in here I would, but I'm doing this PowerPoint narration and I think if I try to type, if I push escape and start typing, it's going to stop the recording. Not not ideal. But anyway, tatvamasi or 
thou art that, you are that thing. This is the wise man's reply to the seeker who says, T can you sum up the wisdom of the Vedas for me? Can you sum up? I mean, I could spend years and years reading and memorizing these sacred revealed scriptures, or can you just sum it up for me? And he says, sure, tatvamasi, you are that, you are that thing. What thing? That thing you've been praying to and praising and seeking, you are that thing. And uh, I mean, that's true unitive philosophical mysticism. You, you, and you and that thing are the same. That's the great reveal at the end of the uh, at the end of yoga. At the end of yoga, or the path of enlightenment and union is union. Yoga is union with that reality. <clears throat> Robert says, "Yeah, been there, done that, had that, and then I kept going." and broke through to this void. And I didn't find much um, discussion of the void until I came across that quote by the Buddha. Uh, I don't know, I, my, you know, in my admittedly non-extensive non contact with Buddhist literature, it seems in the tradition, it seems there's a lot of talk about the void. Shunyata, they call it. Shunyata. Oh God, Shunyata, the void. And, uh, Roberts is aware of that, but she says that usually if, if you really uh, read carefully, you'll see that what most Buddhists are talking about when they talk about encountering the void, they're just talking about the death of the ego. They're just talking about the death of the little ego. Your little self, the one that's worried about whether you're going to pass this course and whether people like you and that gets jealous because someone else is doing better than you are. That's your little ego the little I, and yeah, that's got to go. On the path of enlightenment, that's got to go. And when most Buddhists manage to suppress that for a time, that little ego, they claim something like enlightenment. They think they've made contact with the void. She's saying they, they're just making contact with the quietness behind the noise of the ego. And that quietness is a kind of unity with a larger self. That what what is revealed when the ego is quiet, it is, is your you're, it's like the self then has room to spread. It's not all concentrated in this little spine and it spreads and it becomes more united with this larger capital S self. And uh, she says, you keep going, keep going. And then that big self, which you might think of as God, that dies too, that goes. A little hole appears in it one day and that hole like a <clears throat> like a cigarette hole in the, in the center of a piece of paper starts to grow and then takes over the whole paper and the paper has gone then it's turned to ash and the hole the h-o-l-e hole has taken over that's the real void that roberts claims she experiences anyway whether you know whether she you know how unique her experience is that's i mean that's a question that i don't feel equipped to answer um, but uh, she seems to be reporting it's quite unique. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know if I, I think of this as an official reading of the course or not, but if you, if you go to YouTube, you can, you can, it's a widely available uh, documentary of, really it's focused on the research of Rick Strassman, who's a, who would he be a, be in the psychology department at University of New Mexico, and he's best known for his uh, research into DMT. It's a very powerful psychedelic molecule, which is the active ingredient in ayahuasca and in the Amazonian Indian uh, brew they make from a vine and a leaf they find there. And uh, he got permission from, I guess, the uh, DEA, first of all, to uh, administer DMT in a controlled sort of hospital laboratory setting to human patients and to just record what happens to them. And this is documented in this documentary. Have a look at it. It's, 
I include it because I, I, I wanted to end the course by countering, you know, returning to the holy, returning to the mysterium, and then emphasizing that this is not something that's confined to the past that you have to read about in some questionable, like historically questionable ancient manuscript. Um, you can, I mean, the infosphere is alive and well with credible reports of this kind of experience. And I also don't want you to think that to have this experience, you've got to devote your life to it, become literally a nun or a monk like Bernadette Roberts did, and kind of single-mindedly pursue enlightenment. Um, you can also just <clears throat> have DMT administered to you in one way or another, whether in a laboratory or not, whether synthesized or through some natural means. DMT or about a hundred other psychedelic compounds and very reliably, I mean, that's one of the things that Strassman found that quite reliably people would have very powerful experiences. Atheists would go into these experiences and come out with a very different worldview, not coming out believing in God exactly, but being, being quite sure that there's a lot more to reality than they had, had thought going in. <clears throat> and this is, so this is something that's now democratically available. I mean, it's a controlled substance, like so many of these substances become, which is a whole debate I won't get into here, but. Legally or not, there, there's, to, to the modern seeker, there are a, a lot of um, compounds and uh, like in, in, in the, indigenous traditions, they think of them as sacraments, of course, available to you, which will very reliably, very quickly on a Friday night or a Tuesday afternoon, put you in contact with something extraordinary. And it almost feels like cheating. And I think uh, one of the great suspicions of these experiences is it seems too easy. And whether it's our capitalist Protestant work ethic, or whether it's the influence of these monastic traditions, which I mean, they tell narratives of people who work hard and then are rewarded with their hard work with with mystical experience. I mean, that's the Buddha was a hard worker. I mean, he began his life as a prince in the lap of luxury, you know, laid back in, on cushions. Well, beautiful girls fed him grapes. And I mean, that's the one of the pictures we have of Buddha. And then he started to question that illusion and literally left this walled palace complex, this, which is a nice metaphor for the world of pleasure and illusion. And then worked very hard for seven years, worked harder, uh, as hard as anyone has ever worked. With, and that's one of the, I mean, we talked about the first truth of Buddhism being life is suffering. The fourth, the fourth truth is the way out of suffering is the eightfold path. It's, an eight, it's, it's the first eight step program uh, to enlightenment, to happiness, to the release from suffering at least. And, and uh, you can look it up. If you look up the eightfold path, it's just a series of, of corrections to your current action, right thinking, right living, right, I mean, right livelihood, right concentration, I think is one of them, right effort, pretty sure is one of the Eightfold Path, right effort, whatever the Pali or Sanskrit word for effort there is. The message is, is clear uh, to, to attain enlightenment, you've got to have the right effort. What's the right effort? Total effort, unceasing effort from the time you get up to the time you go to bed, and then eventually you stop even going to bed. Sleep itself is a kind of laziness of the soul. And in the final push to enlightenment, you're not even sleeping. And uh, so we, I mean, this is there in, in the Christian narrative too. Jesus, at least to, if not to become enlightened, to make direct contact with his own divinity. He had to go to the desert and starve himself and engage in some kind of eightfold path there. And... Maybe we we then are fed sort of with our mother's milk the idea that enlightenment being the most special being the the highest achievement if it's real or contact with God is going to be the thing that takes the hardest work and we therefore are immediately suspicious of something that takes no work at all and is very easy right. Then again. Um, you, you gotta be careful about 
elitism and ego actually playing a part in that common conception of enlightenment involving hard work. Maybe you want it, though those who achieve it want it to be something very hard to achieve because, because the thought that anyone could do this easily would be very upsetting to someone who's worked very hard at it. If you've worked very hard at something, it can be upsetting to your ego, to your ego trip, that everyone could have this thing very easily now. And the idea that it takes hard work is the ego's way of actually hanging on to it, of claiming ownership of it. When, when after enlightenment, you, you, you persist with the narrative that this is only achieved through hard work, is that your ego speaking, maybe? Claiming ownership of it? The ego earned it. It was the ego that was operating. It was the ego that was working hard and that got you to enlightenment. And now after enlightenment, it's hanging on and claiming ownership of this thing. And then spreading this doctrine that only through hard work. And the ego loves that idea, right? This is something I can achieve. And you maybe can wonder if Buddha... I mean, he was clearly attached to the idea of achieving enlightenment. That's what motivated him all those years of seeking. Anyway... If enlightenment is easy, as easy as just eating something that a friend gives you, oh, that's no work at all. Well, what what is that? Well, that's trusting your friend, um, maybe. That's something which has come to us through nature, through the laboratory. It's just kind of been brought to us from these mountains, brought down from these mountains, and then distributed to us like... Uh, like bread being passed around at mass. The idea of grace is interesting here. And, you know, I think a lot of Christians who have never heard of DMT and would never take DMT are very familiar with the idea of grace. And in fact, are already suspicious of the narrative that enlightenment is something that you can achieve. And they have this idea of grace to counter it. The idea that, no, when, when, when you make contact with God, it's not you making contact with God. It's God coming down to you. And in a way, you did nothing to earn it. Right? This is something that is infinitely good. And there's nothing your finite self could do to deserve that. When you make contact with God, it's not something you earned. You could never earn the infinite. And so the logically, the only way this thing will ever come to you is undeservedly. It's something that comes to you. And it's just grace. It's like a gift. Grace is a gift, which is something, again, you did not earn. It's extra. It's gratuitous. Well, is it so upsetting to think that grace could come in the form of a just a chemical? Easy. There's the joke about someone who's praying um, praying to win the lottery and then complains to God on the Saturday morning when they didn't win the lottery. And God says, well, you didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> I had it all set up so that if you went into the 7-Eleven and bought that ticket, it would have been the winning ticket. But you you got to go and buy the ticket. I can, I, can, I can help you win the lottery, but you've got to... I work through the ways of the world, through its mechanisms and mediums, like the lottery counter, if you want actual money. And if you want grace, okay, I can give it to you, but I work through mediums. You know, there's always a vehicle of that grace. So uh, have a look at that documentary and uh, see what you see what you think. All right. Uh, the fact of religious diversity is uncontroversial. It's the, the fact that we find ourselves in a world with uh, a diversity uh, of religious traditions, viewpoints, uh, ideas uh, about the divine. And we're going to um, uh, focus now on uh, one very influential 
20th century attempt to explain this diversity and uh, conflict. So just running through th the range of uh, explanations that Hick, John Hick, considers. First, atheism or naturalism seems to have a uh, little, little problem with explaining the diversity, just as um, naturally you'd expect there to be a diversity of cuisines and um, uh, forms of dress across the world's cultures. Um, you, you might expect there to be a diversity of viewpoints on the divine. We, we looked at, uh, when we talked about naturalist explanations of religion, I think we could, we'd find that many of those uh, naturalist explanations in principle shouldn't have much problem explaining diversity. In fact, they would, from their hypothesis, sort of predict global religious diversity. For example, uh, if you take the Feuerbachian projection view that the deities are projections of our own sort of uh, psychology, for Feuerbach there'd be a, a degree of universality across the human species, but also a lot of um, shaping of the image of the deity according to particular cultural expectations, right? Um, um, if you take the sort of Darwinian, evo-psychological approach to world religions. Again, uh, religion being a biocultural phenomenon will, in different biocultural environments, um, evolve a little bit differently. Um, so the way religion, if religion is some kind of, let's, let's take the view that religion is some kind of um, adaptation which helps the tribe cohere in its action and its worldview for more effective uh, <clears throat> behavior. Well, uh, a, a, a desert tribe might develop a different uh, pantheon and relation to it than a tribe in the jungle and a tribe in the Arctic tundra and so on. So, uh, you know, on the assumption of atheism, naturalism, religious diversity, uh, is, is not a great conundrum. Polytheism, um, if we sort of start from that hypothesis, uh, we won't be surprised perhaps if we see the diversity of religious views and deities. Um, the polytheist argues that in fact, sort of metaphysically, cosmically, there are many gods. And then you can explain the uh, diversity of culturally favored uh, deities conceptions of the divine by saying that in, in effect each culture is picking a particular deity or aspect of the deity from from the pantheon <clears throat> or the whole chorus of of the heavenly agents uh, one limitation of the polytheist view is many of the traditions that we need to sort of account for, do not take themselves to be just one wing of a wider global polytheist movement. I mean, the um, uh, Christian who takes Jesus of Nazareth to be Jesus Christ, and in fact, more strongly than Messiah, the incarnation of the one true deity, the one true incarnation of the one true deity, that, that doesn't sound very much like they're just... Uh, picking one particular god, call him Yahweh, from the pantheon. Um, th though it is interesting to note, I mean, maybe maybe in uh, some, some defense of the polytheist view, if you look at the sort of um, genealogical history of Yahweh, Yahweh does emerge from a wider Near Eastern pantheon of deities. And so if you go back far enough in the sort of cultural history of the Yahweh cult, Yahweh was at one point, now this might be uh, even centuries before what we would identify as Judaism arises, but Yahweh was once um, part of a larger pantheon. And in fact, maybe even uh, uh, sort of um, in, the, in, in, in the second or third generation of gods, 
Uh, anyway, um, if, if you're going the polytheistic route, you need to radically translate most of these traditions, um, right? Um, uh, especially, uh, I mean, dramatically, the monotheist traditions, which claim to be uh, triangulating their worship on the one true deity, uh, turns out by the polytheist view that they're radically mistaken. Exclusivism uh, is sort of biting the bullet and saying, well, yes, there's a diversity of religious viewpoints, in fact, conflicting. I mean, um, the, the, the Muslims and, and the Christians, uh, though siblings of a larger sort of Abrahamic family of prophetic religion, are in logical contradiction. Um, now, you might be able to say that uh, Yahweh and uh, Allah are really two faces, facets of the same single sky deity. Uh, but the logical conflict between Christianity and Islam would be, uh, I think, first of all, in their understanding of the lineage of prophets uh, who come to us to, to uh, sort of seal our relationship with this deity. In Islam, of course, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, the final um, and greatest uh, and clearest of the whole Abrahamic line. In Christianity, uh, you could begin by recognizing Jesus's affinities with the uh, lineage of Abrahamic prophets, but then, then of course, the Christian is distinct by their belief that Jesus is much more than a, a prophet or a kind of radio on our behalf to the divine. Um, for the Christian, Jesus is God himself in fleshly form. So the exclusivist will pick a religion, basically, um, and and say that one is correct. And insofar as the others conflict with it, the others are incorrect. Or an exclusivist could, I, I guess, refrain from picking uh, a particular religion and just as a sort of a more abstracted uh, explanation of religious diversity point out that logically uh, one possibility is that where there's conflict that means that one of the traditions or answers is correct and then the others are, are false okay so exclusivism will actually be the view internal to many of these religious traditions um, there they believe that they have the correct viewpoint and and the others have the incorrect viewpoint it's it gets a little bit complicated when you when you um move to the slightly more uh, ecumenical south asian traditions i mean hinduism's got this sort of um generously big tent view of the world religions i, I think you'll find in uh, I, don't, I don't know the whole history of this this tendency i mean it's got its roots way back in in um Vedanta, but it might be something that emerges more with with the congresses of world religion in the, in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, where Hinduism starts to see itself as this sort of global space within which all the religions of the world can fit. Uh, I mean, if you talk to a lot of Hindus, they, they don't have a problem thinking about Jesus as even even more than a great prophet, I think you'll find some Hindus who are willing to think about Jesus as perhaps something more along the lines of of an incarnation of um, of the the deity. Um, of course, the Hindu would ultimately logically conflict even that generous Hindu who's willing to welcome Jesus into the lineage of Vish, Vishnu's avatars. Um, whether Jesus or the eighth, the eighth or the ninth or the tenth or the eleventh, um, I'll, I'll let the the Hindus um, tell me. But um, even if if the Hindu welcomes Jesus into that lineage of avatars or incarn incarnations of God, th that Hindu differs from the Christian in that the Christian again is exclusivist. The Christian believes that Jesus was the first and last incarnation of God, whereas the, the Hindu tends to see a long line stretching 
actually far back into animal history. I mean, the lineage of Hindu avatars goes back into the animal world and it sort of follows maybe roughly um, the evolution of life. I mean, I think it, one of the early avatars of Vishnu is a, a water creature, some kind of fish. Uh, okay, so, but I, I just want you to notice that exclusivism is logically one of the options on the table here that um, when there's a diversity of viewpoints in general, one possibility of what's going on is one of the viewpoints is correct and the others are incorrect. Ah. Now, the, the view we're looking at today is what John Hick calls transcendental pluralism. I think this view goes by different names. And um, I think the pluralism tells us he's going to try to uh, facilitate the diversity in a way which doesn't uh, um, exclusively pick pick one over the other. So he's going to try to tell a you know happy story where um, all uh, well happy like this picture I guess where they all seem to be getting along. In fact, this picture uh, maybe um, is a pretty decent representation of Hicks' view, and we'll use it in the following slides. But I mean, we, we see a kind of extreme cartoonish diversity here of, of the deity, uh, but they seem to be getting along and laughing um, sort of from outside of our limited perspective. Though Zeus doesn't, Zeus looks a little bit crazy angry, but um, they, basically they seem to be copacetic. They seem to be getting along and they seem to be saying to us, you know, A-okay, um, there's there's a joke maybe that they're waiting for us to get, and the joke might be we are we all are one in the end that we are the different faces of the the the, the one same uh, deity, okay, and that that is <clears throat> the transcendental part. Transcendental means above or beyond, and Hicks' view is that uh, beyond the diversity of of masks of the deity that we find across the world cultures. There's behind it all kind of a single reality, um, which because it's transcendental, we, we can't access directly. Okay. We access it always by its, its mediating masks. So, um, <laughs> The trick for me as the slide uh, creator here, um, I mean, we want to use images, but strictly speaking, there's no image I could pick to represent the transcendental deity. Um, it's not light. It's not pure light or energy. When, <laughs> you see, for Hicks' view, even by the time we call it something like pure light or energy, um, we're putting a mask on it. The mask doesn't have to be a face. The mask can be attributes like light and energy and um, omnipotence and omniscience. These are all, though quite abstract or conceptual, these are all um, uh, modifications or mediations of what Hick calls variously the noumenon or the real, capital R, real, <laughs> or the thing itself, the Ding an sich, that's a, 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 a German phrase from, from Kantian philosophy, which means the thing itself. The thing itself is the tree um, that no one hears or sees, or the tree behind your uh, auditory and visual perceptions of it. Your, your, your perceptions of it are mediations of it. And we can ask, well, what is the tree dig on sick or in itself? Okay, so the noumenon is, is the, the real itself behind all of our encounters with it. Whenever we encounter it in mystical experience or whenever we conceptualize it in a philosophy of religion class, um, um, I mean, outside of calling it the real in and of itself, we're we're really looking at its personae and impersonae. Okay, 
So there's the noumenon, which is behind all of the uh, cast, the colorful cast of masks. And then there's the plurality of impersonae and personae, which are the, this cast. And um, these are sort of, you could say, masks that the real puts on, like the masks of dramatic performance. I I should just say something about this distinction between personae and, and impersonae. Um, um, and I already have a little bit when I talked about even some of the abstract attributes like omnipotence being uh, part of the mask system. But this is, I mean, Hicks' view is quite simple, really. It's its really built around this, this key distinction between the noumenon, the thing itself, that's the true deity behind all of our perceptions of it. And in our interaction, interface with the deity, it's always via uh, these personae or impersonae, right? And different cultures, different traditions will uh, develop a relationship with a different facet of this thing. And maybe if, if we look like Hick is a little bit at all the facets, you're getting maybe a, a, a better sense of what the thing is. You can sort of triangulate the angles of all these different facets and, 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 and get some enlarged or uh, truer sense of what the noumenon is. I don't know how comfortable Hick would be with this idea on developing, but um, uh, e even when you do that, I, th I think it's... it's um, I think it's safe to say, even when you triangulate these different facets onto the real, you, you don't get the real itself ever. I think Hicks very wedded to this view, which again, it's, it's rooted in this view going back at least to Immanuel Kant, or maybe all the way back to Plato in his cave, that we, we interface with reality uh, via shadows and masks. And we don't connect with the real thing itself. Well, I guess in Plato's case, we do. Uh, uh, we can, through through philosophy, uh, sort of crawl our way out of that cave and into the true sun of the beatific vision of the of the form of the true and the good. But um, Kant's view, <clears throat> I think, was more skeptical ultimately that uh, we don't interface ever with the real itself. And Hicks, I guess, following uh, applying that Kantian model to to religious epistemology here. So none of these faces, Ganesh, Jesus, Buddha, uh, the alien rabbit god, uh, none of these is the real in itself, but each of them is the real as it affects a particular stream of religious consciousness. So um, each individual will probably have their own particular micro facet onto the divine if they have a relationship with it. But that individual is located in a, in a cultural tradition and that cultural uh, interface will have a certain style or angle. I mean, if you're raised in first century Palestine, you'll have a, a, a particular angle on that deity. So this is, uh, I, you know, the, the, these masks are, are um, arise at the interface of our uh, personal and cultural specificities and the real itself, right? Okay. Now this view, it's, it's, I mean, this John Hick is writing in the, the 20th century, largely. And he points out that this, this distinction he's drawing between the real in and of itself, God, the, the high deity behind all of our um, images of it, and then the images themselves, the personae, in personae, this, this view Hick recognizes has um, been pointed to by particular religious traditions. So the, these very sophisticated religious traditions will, will often point out to um, maybe their more um, philosophically inclined uh, followers that we must be careful as Kabbalists or Vedantists, for example, to distinguish between, for the Kabbalists, it's Ein Sof is is the deity in and of itself, Ein Sof is like the Ansik deity, and in Vedanta, I, I think, I think, I think Vedanta would be the right thing to call it here. Um, Brahman is is the name for the already quite abstracted uh, divinity. Um, Brahman is the uh, sort of in, in the Trimurti or Trinity of high deities of Hinduism. Brahman is the 
maintainer of the world itself. And Brahman is often the word used to describe sort of the, the, the deity in its most, uh, well, not quite most. <laughs> uh, well, Brahman is, 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 is the ultimate uh, reality. But there's this distinction between the Nirgun Brahman and the Sagun Brahman. The Nir, Nirgun means uh, without qualities or colors. Um, so there's the Brahman, which really lacks any qualities or uh, traits that we could name. And that's sort of the pure Einsof Ansik Brahman behind the more qualitative Brahman, which we might talk about in worship and even in our perfect being theology. Um, okay. So Hicks view is not in the end brand new. And I think he takes it to be uh, a point in favor of his view that this distinction has been recognized in some of our sort of high philosophical religious traditions um, prior. So the personae um, are the familiar faces, uh, you know, that we could literally picture. Um, uh, these are uh, personae, uh, which notice we all manifest personae. Um, I mean, we could we could ask who is the the true you behind the masks. Um, but you you do put on different uh, personae for different relationships. I don't think that's a, a thing to criticize. I don't think that means you're phony. I think it's very necessary to adapt uh, you, yourself to different relationships. You should you should be sort of a different persona in your relationship with your mother compared to your relationship with your uh, spouse and your peers and uh, the person at the uh, convenience store counter. So um, go, uh, the divine, the uh, I'm, uh, the ding on sick has these different personae. A little bit trickier or subtler to make sense of in, in Hicks' view is this notion of the impersonae also. So um, the noumenon takes on these per personal masks, which often literally have faces. I mean, in the case of Jesus, the incarnation of God, that's God really taking on a vividly uh, physical face. Um, but the, the noumenon also is manifest through these impersonae. These are like impersonal <laughs> masks. Um, they don't, they certainly don't literally have faces. And uh, I mentioned the Sagun Brahman. This would be Brahman with qualities. Uh, like Sat, Chit, Ananda. Uh, the, uh, uh, so so if, if, if we ask the uh, pundit, um, uh, what, what, what is Brahman? What, how can we truly describe Brahman? What are Brahman's uh, qualities? The, the short answer often given is, is this uh, triplet of quality, Sat, Chit, Ananda, I think it's existence, uh, awareness, and bliss. It's just pure conscious persistence, which has a blissful uh, qualitative dimension. Um, that's very abstract. I mean, if, if um, you tell me that that's your God, that's the God you worship, you worship the uh, ultimate reality, which is pure blissful consciousness, uh, which is behind all the cosmic permutations that we're embedded in, I would say you're, you're dealing with something which is already quite abstracted from the more usual personal masks. But according to Hick, even at this level of abstraction, you're engaged with a kind of mask of the deity. As soon as you assign it these qualities, you're uh, modifying it a little bit according to your own cultural expectations. I mean, I, I guess Hick might say, well, we are conscious, um, now and then blissful beings, or we aspire to bliss. And so we project a little bit in our interface with the noumenon, with the real, and we conceive of it as being a sort of humming persistence of consciousness that's blissful. And um, for Hick, that, that will not be pure 
construction. We're not just pure, just completely making that up, slapping paint on on the real. Um, that that uh, that perception we have, maybe through our mystical contact or interface with the noumenon, that sense that we have that it too is some kind of humming consciousness. Uh, you know, we're probably aimed at it, and again, we're getting a facet of that thing, so it's not disconnected from the reality of it. This when we assign it these qualities, but when we assign it qualities, we we still are it, it's still coming to us in a kind of mask. So same same with these very abstracted views of the ultimate reality or deity. I mean, it's it's we hesitate to even call something like Nirvana a deity because uh, deity implies a kind of persona. And uh, nirvana just is the windless place beyond impermanence, which a Buddhist aspires to. Enlightenment is is a kind of, uh, could, could we say, a, a unity of the self or dissolving of the self into nirvana. And th that too, according to Hick, is a kind of impersona, <laughs> which is just a, a very blank kind of mask that we put on, on the deity. And Bernadette Roberts' encounter with the no-self, I... I I mean, I think Hick is very wedded to this view that any experience we a human has with the noumenon, no matter how abstracted and stripped of quality it sounds, and it's hard to find a mystical account which is more um, vociferously stripped of qualitative description than Bernadette Roberts, but. Um, I think Hick would say, still, still there. That's when you call it the no self. You're giving it a kind of mask already. And really, most of our, maybe all of our, absolutely perfect being theology, when we're delineating and uh, deriving the various qualities of the deity, I think there too we are um, um, engaged, according to Hick, with uh, uh, qualitative modification of the noumenon. And if we ask, well, okay, what is the noumenon? What is the thing behind all of the uh, personae and impersonae at the interface? Well, I think Hick has to, has to say there's not too much we can say about it. We can say that it is the ground of all reality. It is the, uh, the source which we are aimed at in our religious encounters. Uh, but uh, beyond that, we can't say too, too much about it.